Sorry to keep you all waiting. Uh, I never was early anyway. This is the uh, Music Moreau meeting. It's also co-sponsored by the honoraries in mathematics and industrial engineering. And putting in a plug uh, commercial for the university, it's paid by uh, GSB and the Committee on Lectures and the Graduate College. So we'd like to extend thanks to them to bring in bringing us the uh, speaker tonight. And uh, because it is late, I'll just introduce Wayne Fuller of the Stat Department, who will introduce our speaker tonight. It is a sincere pleasure to introduce the speaker. It's always nice when you introduce uh, someone so well known that it's unnecessary to waste very much of the uh, audience's time and so I'll try to do that this evening. Morris Hansen's presently the senior vice president of Westat which is a, a research firm specializing I think it's proper to say in uh, survey design and practice for many years, he was with the Bureau of the Census, and it, I think it's here that clearly that uh, he earned the respect of the statistical community uh, for the introduction of uh, new methods and techniques that were responsible for improving a lot of our national statistics. He mentioned last night, I think it's 33 years that he spent with the Census Bureau, and he said it was good fun, and that. He, I'm sure he meant that, and I was uh, fortunate to work with the Census Bureau a few of those last years while he was there, and, and there was a, a, a real spirit to the Census Bureau when he was there, uh, a feeling of innovation and a willingness to try out uh, new ideas, and it, it was fun, I'm sure. Uh, I have here a list of publications in uh, the well-known journals of our profession. Probably the best-known publication is a two-volume book, Sample Survey Methods and Theory, uh, co-authored with Hurwitz and Maddow. He's a fellow uh, of the Institute of Math Stat, of the American Statistical Association. He's past president of both of those associations, uh, an honorary fellow of the Royal Statistical Society. There's also a list of advisory committees and of awards he's won. I, uh, I'll spare you the reading of all those. There's, last year was the first meeting of a recently formed International Association of Survey Statisticians, and I think it's indicative of the respect with which he's held by his fellow samplers that he was elected president of that organization. So let me introduce the speaker, Morris Hansen, Sample Surveys, a popular review of principles, methods, and applications. Thanks, Wayne. It's a real pleasure to have a chance to get back meet my friends at Ames that I've worked with over the years and who've made major contributions that the developments that have taken place and to have the opportunity to meet some new ones. Well, sampling methodology provides an exceedingly powerful tool and is now widely used to provide information needed to guide planning, decisions, and administration and evaluation in government and in industry to settle such things as court cases, and for research in many different settings and circumstances. An illustration is the monthly sample survey of retail trade in the United States, conducted by the Bureau of the Census. This survey provides estimates of retail sales by kind of business from a monthly sample of approximately 1% of the retail stores of the country. Estimates of monthly changes of retail sales are made with sampling errors of less than 1%. Uh, from this sample, 
the uh, total retail sales that would be shown by the five-year censuses of retail trade have been estimated and have turned out to be within 1 percent, but available maybe a year before the census, a year and a half. Another illustration is a recent sample survey of approximately 3,500 manufacturers concerned with the potential for changing to the metric system in the United States. The purpose of this study was to ascertain the extent of use of metric measurements at the present time in American industry. Attitudes towards changing to the metric system among manufacturers. Problems of doing so and intentions. It provided information to help guide the National Bureau of Standards in making recommendations to, to the Congress in this area of current concern. In taking a sample, we are interested in making estimates or drawing inferences about some total population. We do this by first defining the population for which information is desired, by drawing a sample from the population using appropriate sampling procedures, and often, although not always, it may be a quite small sample, relatively. Then by making observations on the sample units, and by summarizing the results and making estimates from the sample. Sample surveys are used to obtain information in a very wide range of subject areas. I will illustrate by mentioning a few types of populations. For example, populations of people, of families, of housing units, of business units, such as the two surveys I mentioned briefly a minute ago. Samples of such things as shipments by rail or truck, or of fires, of users of products. A current interesting survey being developed is of the victims of crimes. One we did recently had having to do with no-fault insurance had to do with the seriously injured persons in auto accidents and their characteristics. Another very important survey deals with prices paid for products and services. Some of these surveys are one-time surveys. Others provide measurements in time or space, or both. For example, changes in prices paid by consumers over time, as well as by various parts of the country. Sample surveys are used to answer such questions as how many unemployed people are there in the United States? And how does unemployment vary by age, sex, race, and other characteristics? How do these measures change over time? And how do they, ver they vary in different parts of the country? It seems sort of obvious, but one of the major important things to do in designing sample surveys is to get a clear definition of goals. It is a primary requirement in survey design, as in other types of activities. Although the need for a clear definition of goals as a first step seems obvious, it is commonly found in practice that in approaching a problem in sample survey design, the clarification of goals often receives inadequate attention, and the consequence is unnecessarily poor design and results. A particularly useful approach in the definition of clarification of goals is to forget the use of sampling. Assume for initial thinking purposes that resources are not a problem and define what would be done to obtain the desired measurements and to summarize and analyze the, the desired information if the job were to be done through a complete census of the target population without the use of sampling. This kind of thinking may indeed reveal that there is no specific finite population that is of interest. Instead, it may become clear that information is desired that may help in drawing inferences about a cause system. For example, how do the services rendered and costs of health care differ under some specified alternative health delivery systems? One way to provide approximate answers to such a question would be to obtain information through a sample survey on persons receiving services under different health care systems and obtain measures of the services provided, their costs, and perhaps measures of their effectiveness, such as days lost from work through illness. Drawing inferences from such observations has many pitfalls. 
But nevertheless, such information can be exceedingly helpful in pro if properly used. And such approaches are properly used only when it's not feasible to uh, provide evidence through experiments where randomization is possible to a treatment and control group, for example. The definition of goals will include some consideration, not only of the kinds of information desired, but of the accuracy with which the information is needed, or the accuracy that is worth buying. That is, by consideration of the implied costs of wrong actions or decisions that may reasonably result from various levels of inaccuracy in the information that is obtained. As a more specific illustration, the United States Consumer Price Index is used in labor management bargaining as a factor in determining wage rates and fringe benefits and in many other issues and programs. Many billions or perhaps hundreds of billions of dollars are involved and differences of, few, of a few percentage points can influence billions of dollars in wage negotiations, adjustment of Social Security benefits, in program recommendations or decisions by the Congress or the executive branch, and in local government and industry. Consequently, relatively high levels of accuracy are needed and worth paying for in such a survey. The definition of goals will also include some consideration of the accuracy with which it is feasible to make the desired measurements. Thus, suppose information is desired on consumer expenditures by families. How much was spent during the prior year for goods and services by type of expenditure, for example, clothing, food, recreation, and other types? Even if the whole population was asked questions concerning consumer expenditures, the answers would be subject to errors of response or measurement. There is no point in taking a big enough sample to reduce sampling errors to as small as, say, 2% in estimates in which the measurement errors will be of the order of magnitude of, say, 5 or 10 or 20%. With limited resources for the per survey, perhaps a more effective utilization of resources can achieve reductions in measurement errors at the price of an increase in sampling errors, but with net gains in overall accuracy of the survey results that is, a decrease in the joint effect of the contributions of sampling and measurement errors. The principles and theory of sample surveys guide an efficient design of surveys to produce maximum precision of results per unit of cost. Also, from well-designed and executed sample results, we can obtain valid measures of the precision of the sample estimates from the sample itself. It may be useful first to illustrate through an example what is meant by sampling errors and how they may be controlled jointly by sample size and sample design. Suppose as a very simple illustration that we want to know the proportion of people in Ames that have some minimum defined level of health insurance. Let's assume, as is presumably true, that no up-to-date lists exist of the people living in Ames. Although it is not a practical or desirable way to go about it, suppose that we did a canvas and prepared a list of all of the people living in Ames and assigned serial numbers to them. Then, using a table of random numbers, we could draw a random sample of, say, 25 persons. Through a questionnaire and interview, we could collect the desired information for those 25 persons. The proportion of those 25 persons that have the specified kind of health insurance would be an estimate of the proportion we would have found had we obtained the information for all persons in the city. Suppose also that this latter proportion is 50 percent. Now assume that as a demonstration we repeated the operation of sample selection and measurement through the questionnaire and prepared an estimate for each sample of 25. And that we repeated this operation many times. Actually, theory tells us what would happen to those estimates without going through the operation. We would find that with samples of 25, all, all of the estimated percentages would almost certainly lie within the interval 10% to 90%, and approximately two-thirds of them would lie in the interval 30% to 60%. That is a range of 
a rather wide range of error because the sample size is very small. If we increase the size of the sample to 100, the range of errors would be cut in half. And if we increase the size of a sample to, say, 1,600 people, the range of error would re be reduced to the point where all of the estimates would almost certainly lie within the range 46% to 54%. As one expects intuitively, the range of sampling variability decreases with increasing size of sample. And with a moderate size of sample, the range of errors may be acceptably small. However, the whole procedure of canvassing and preparing lists that I have just described for drawing a sample for aims is in fact an impractical, or at least a very costly approach. And even if it is not impractical for Ames, it would be highly impractical for the state of Iowa or for drawing a sample from the whole United States. Now let us consider, consider an alternative sampling plan. We might draw a sample of roughly 25 or 30 people by preparing a list of the city blocks in Ames and drawing one block at random and obtaining the desired information by canvassing all of the residents of the selected city block. I believe it is reasonably obvious intuitively that such a sample would be far less reliable for a given number of persons in the sample because the people within a block may be more or less similar in their social and economic characteristics. We might increase the sample size to include 50 blocks and thus perhaps 1,500 people it seems reasonable and it is likely to be true that a sample of 50 blocks would provide more reliable results than a sample of 100 individual people drawn independently at random, as was assumed in the first example. Each procedure would buy, provide unbiased estimates in the sense that on the average for a large enough sample or over many samples, the proportion having the characteristic to be measured would be the same as in the total population. But this is not enough. What is needed is a design and size of sample that assures adequate precision for the purposes to be served with a single sample we have in hand. For a relatively small sample at least, the approach of using city blocks as sampling units is much less costly per person included in the sample than listing the entire population and sampling from the list. However, although it is less costly for a fixed number of persons in the sample, the city block approach is much less reliable for a given size of sample. Statistical theory, along with experimental study, would answer the question of which approach would produce the most reliable results per unit of cost. However, both methods are exceedingly inefficient in that it would be costly to obtain an acceptable sample by either of the methods I've illustrated. Actually, we don't need to choose between these two rather extreme methods. We can use a combination of them and other statistical tools to arrive at relatively efficient sample design. For example, we might draw a sample of 50 blocks, prepare a list of the residential addresses in the selected blocks, subsample addresses, collect the desired information, and prepare estimates for the persons at the subsampled addresses. A sample of perhaps 600 persons in 200 households from 50 blocks selected by this procedure might reasonably cost you less and yield more re reliable results than would either of the more extreme procedures I described. Sampling theory, supplemented by some empirical study, would guide in determining the optimal allocation of the sample in such a system. For example, it would help determine how many blocks and how many households per block should be selected to achieve maximum precision of results for a fixed cost and what size of sample is needed to achieve a appropriate level of precision. Drawing a sample representing the entire United States population would be far more difficult than drawing a sample for Ames. If we were drawing the sample for the entire United States, a practical kind of design of a type that is often used would be to draw a multi-stage area sample. As an oversimplified illustration of this approach, we might first draw a sample of, say, 100 counties. We might then proceed by subdividing the sampled counties into smaller communities and drawing a sample of perhaps two of these smaller communities within each sampled county for a total of 200 communities. Lists are readily available of counties, 
and for communities, along with information on their population size and characteristics that could be used in the drawing the samples at each stage. As the next stage of sampling, we might subdivide each sampled community into smaller areas on a map, such as city blocks or parts of city blocks, and rural communities of, simple si of similar size in terms of numbers of people or households. We could then draw a sample of these, say, say two from each sampled community. Next, we might prepare a list of the residential addresses within each of these small sampled areas and draw a subsample of these. A next step would be to collect the desired information for the residents of these sample addresses and summarize and prepare sample estimates from this information. For example, we could use the proportion that have the specified health insurance in this sample as an estimate of the proportion for all persons in the United States. It should be clear that such a sampling process is not one for some individual person to use to get a sample easily overnight at practically no cost. But variations of such a procedure are indeed practical and used by many survey organizations. Although usually such a sample would not be used in conducting a single small scale one time survey, once the general design work is done, many different sample surveys may be drawn from various subsamples of what might be called the master sample that has been prepared. <clears throat> the clustering of such a sample into counties and into smaller areas within counties has two purposes. The first purpose is to make it feasible to make an up-to-date list of addresses and draw samples of households and thus of people. The second purpose would be to reduce the amount of travel to be done in making personal interviews. It would be very costly to spread, say, 1,600 interviews over the entire United States without clustering them into a relatively small sample of counties. Well, I've illustrated only a few principles and procedures that might be used and shall now briefly refer to some others without trying to discuss them in detail in order to give the flavor of some of the methods and alternatives and how one might approximate an optimum design for a particular purpose. The earlier illustrations included the use of individual people as sampling units. They also illustrated the use at various stages of selection of counties, smaller communities, and smaller areas defined on a map within communities, and finally households as sampling units, all when the final goal was to select a sample of people. Such units may be used as a means of clustering a sample to reduce costs of travel, or simply because lists of the desired units, that is of people, are not available, and such units provide a means of preparing lists for sample selection. Aerial sampling units have proved useful in sampling farms, businesses, and many other units, as well as people. However, in sampling economic units, such as farms or businesses, Lists of large units, at least, frequently are available, and it is appropriate and desirable to draw them from such lists, and area samples may be used to sample that part of the population not included on the available lists. The identification and definition of efficient sampling units for use in either single or multi-stage sampling are a powerful tool in effective sample survey design. The selection of such units with known probabilities means that the people or other units associated with them are also selected with known probabilities. The simplified illustration of a, na of a national sample that I just described is of a multi-stage sample. I illustrated a four-stage sample. I shall not say more about multi-stage sampling except that multi-stage sampling is an exceedingly powerful and useful tool and widely used in sample survey design. An important principle that can be introduced is stratification. Basically, in stratification, all the sampling units at each stage of selection are placed in mutually exclusive and exhaustive groups called strata. An attempt is made to group together units that have similar characteristics. 
In selecting the sample, one or more units is selected from each stratum. If counties were being stratified, for example, one would not group together Manhattan County and New York City and a rural county in Iowa so that one or the other of them might be selected from that stratum by a chance procedure. Actually, there is no assumption, as is often thought to be necessary, that the units within a stratum are alike or homogeneous. But the more homogeneous they are, the greater the precision of results that can be achieved for a given size of sample or per unit of cost. Another principle is optimum allocation of the sample. Actually, Manhattan County and New York City, Los Angeles County, Cook County with Chicago, and a few other large counties are so large that most multi-stage national sample surveys should include these units with certainty in the sample. Perhaps half of certain other large counties should be included. For other smaller counties, a much smaller fraction should be included in the sample, often with the probability of inclusion depending on the approximate population size. But for such a sample, it still may be desirable to give each member of the population an equal chance of being included in the sample. To accomplish this, a much smaller subsampling rate would be used within New York City then would be used in a smaller county that only, had only a small chance of being selected for the sample. The optimum choice of sampling fractions are often but not necessarily such that all persons have the same chance of being included in the sample, although variable sampling fractions are introduced at intermediate stages of sample selections. Cost functions are developed and sources of sampling variability are in, taken into account such that the overall design yields approximately sampling fractions for various types of counties and at the various stages of selection and that provide approximately the maximum precision of results per unit of cost. Supplementary information such as is available from censuses and other sources provides an effective tool to guide the efficient design of samples. It is used in stratification, in allocation of sampling fractions, in defining sampling units, and in many other ways. Probability samples can be designed following appropriate sampling principles that make use of sources in, of information in drawing the samples and in preparing the estimates from the samples but that utilize the information in such a way that the information, if effectively used, increases the efficiency of the sample. However, if properly used, even though the information be, may be out of date or in error, this will not in any way bias the sample results. Again, much of the work in sampling is involved in identifying effective available information and its use in sample selection and estimation within the framework of achieving maximum precision of results per unit of cost. It should be clear that good sample designs identify and make use of available relevant information, but also they can be well designed even though very little information is available. For example, after World War II, uh, we were working with uh, some people from China before the communist regime took over, working on the design of a sample to measure the total population of China and its characteristics. There had never been a census of China, and very limited information was available to use in sample design. But information on administrative units and orders of magnitude of their size was available, and this type of information can be used, and we had planned a method of drawing what would have been a quite effective sample of China under such circumstances. However, such a sample would be more costly for the precision achieved than if much more information had, what had been available and could have been used in the sample design. Unfortunately, the, that particular sample design never was put to work. <laughs> 
Well, much of sampling theory is directed at the goal of achieving the desired results at minimum cost or of re achieving results of maximum feasible precision for a fixed total cost. There are many other tools and procedures than those I have described, some of great effectiveness, but the above brief illustrations indicate some of the approaches that are taken in designing a sample. Various tools for actual collection of information are available and may be used. Methods that frequently are used include interviews, personal or by telephone, collection of information through a mailed questionnaire, direct observation, the conducting of various types of experiments, the keeping of diaries, obtaining information from records, and many others. The whole area of collection methods and observation procedures is a complex one in which the control of measurement errors is the goal, again, in an effort to achieve the desired precision at minimum cost. In measurement, however, the problem of response errors is a special one that may or may not be adequately controlled in a particular survey. For the control of sampling errors, we have much more adequate theory and method. Uh, let me illustrate with one technique for control of measurement errors. I mentioned earlier the problem of uh, uh, there are two types of errors that are fairly common. Uh, in this approach. One type of error is what is called uh, telescoping information. That is, people often have a tendency to, uh, if in talking about expenditures, for example, to believe that those expenditures occurred in, more, in a more recent period than they did. And therefore, you ask expenditures for a particular period and you'll get an over-report on expenditures. There's an offsetting type of error uh, of memory loss in which you just forget certain expenditures. And of course, if you could get the right balance between these two, everything would be great. <laughs> but uh, what has been done with considerable effectiveness is what has been called using bounded interviews, in which a series of interviews are done at the same households and identify <coughs> for the household what they have reported in a prior interview so that that same purchase, for example, will not be reported in the current interview if it actually came from an early, earlier period and reduce the effect of telescoping. And if this time periods are made with appropriate frequency, reduce reasonably well the uh, effects of memory loss. Well, these are the types of things that can be used to help control measurement errors. Well, the design of an effective total system for taking a survey or a sequence of sample surveys is the goal, not just the selection of a sample. In the design of an effective total system, the first step is to identify relevant resources, methods, and theory. Then to put these together to achieve maximum return, that is, maximum accuracy per unit of cost, subject to restraints such as the following that we do uh, undertake to use prior studies and results, plus studies of the current problem, to guide in approximating an optimum design. From among the many alternative survey designs that one can in practice choose from, or innovate and create, we must adopt a workable system, one that will work within the framework of the resources available for doing the survey. It must be feasible to do what is specified with the available resources, the types of people that will be doing the job, and the funds and other resources available. Execution and control must be in substantial performance with the plan, and this takes positive steps to introduce control over the execution of the survey. From among the alternatives that meet the above restraints, we want to optimize the design. Although one of the problems you have to remember is the old uh, statement that the best is the enemy of the good. If you keep working to get the best, you probably never get the job done. Uh, so that you do a good job and uh, evaluate what you have done, bring it under reasonable control.
Well, when you get through with such a survey, of course, you prepare not only estimates themselves, but estimates of precision of results and uh, evaluation uh, studies uh, of uh, sources of measurement error and how effectively they have been controlled, where they are at least an important problem. An analysis of components, of cost, and of variability, and of the effectiveness, effectiveness of the control methods that have been used, so that they, these kinds of information can be used to improve future design. Let me finish by talking about, a little more specifically, a particular illustration of a sample survey. This is a rather large-scale one conducted by the Bureau of the Census. The current population survey, it is called. It's a monthly sample survey of approximately 50,000 households each month with a rotating sample of households. Information on employment, unemployment, by age and sex and race and other characteristics is the prime purpose of the survey. And this type of information is collected and published each month. And this type of information is used in governmental policy. And again, it's an area where high precision is important. It's used <coughs> in many different uh, areas of activity. Data are collected once a month during a one-week period. They are summarized and published within two weeks after the completion of the data collection period. Well, this vehicle, this sample, is used not only for collecting of the information that I just described, the labor force information, but it is a very important resource for collecting information in many other subject areas. A supplemental study on various subjects is taken each month. And as a byproduct, these supplemental surveys are obtained at quite low cost as compared with collecting them through independent approaches. Well, some of these subjects uh, covered uh, include such things as uh, an annual updating of the census. That is, the Census Bureau in the decennial census collects information on education, income, migration, fertility, many other subjects. And the census, the decennial census, provides this information for not only the United States, but for exceedingly small areas, states, counties, cities, other levels of area. A sample such as the current population survey could provide most of this information just as well and from some points of view better for the United States, but it cannot produce it for small areas because the sample is not large enough. But it is useful and effective, that particular sample survey, for updating the information at the national level and for larger areas within the country. And this is indeed done on an annual basis. The survey is also used for more detail than is collected monthly on employment and unemployment characteristics. For example, how many persons hold two jobs and things like this that are subjects of special investigation from time to time. Other special topics that are collected uh, regularly or from time to time include subjects such as rather extensive and detailed information on elderly persons, their living arrangements, income, and many other factors that can be used in guiding program and policy planning and actions in connection with the elderly. Travel studies dealing with the amount of travel and types of travel of the population. Recreational activities and expenditures. Adult education. Voting registration and voting. Although in this particular case, in a governmental survey, the voting deals with did the person vote, not who he voted for. And many other subjects. It's a tremendously powerful tool for collecting information of such types. The design is a multi-stage area sample, somewhat as I illustrated earlier, although differing in very important ways, of course. The first stage sampling units are counties or groups of counties. The final stage sampling units are segments, that is, clusters of approximately four households. All members of the sampled households are included in the sample, and these particular decisions are uh, 
appropriate in terms of optimum design, taking account of costs and sources of variance and getting the most precision that can be achieved reasonably per unit of cost. The sample is a probability sample, and as such, it properly reflects the results of population shifts as they take place. <coughs> Ordinarily, a responsible member reports for all members of the household. There are many sample design features that I shall not attempt to describe here. An outstanding feature that I will say a few words about is the effort to control performance in accordance with specifications. Several hundred permanent part-time interviewers collect the information. Usually they are housewives who enjoy and are effective at doing this type of work. Training and control programs include uh, the use of selection examinations and the recruiting of enumerators as there is turnover more or less constant in such a staff. There is initial study training at home by interviewers when they're recruited examinations of performance, then several days of group training with simulated interviews and real practice interviews and additional examinations. Now these are the types of things that occur uh, at the initiation of new interviewers. Then there are many continuing activities that are designed to control the quality of performance. Home training and testing is continued from time to time on a planned basis. Sample re-interviews are conducted. Supervisors or, or uh, senior interviewers go back to the households and re-interview. And uh, the results of these re-interviews are used to identify possible misunderstandings of the work by interviewers and fed back to them to improve their performance. Similarly, there's what is called a, an observation program. <coughs> the supervisor or senior interviewers accompany interviewers to the households and simply observe them and record how they go about doing the interviewing and uh, then provide feedback to the interviewers and a record for use in centrally on the quality of performance. Corrective actions are in general taken from these types of things but in addition to this the uh, returns are edited uh, computer edited as well as certain types of manual editing for inconsistencies or incompleteness and uh, records are kept interviewer by interviewer on this and feedback is done and uh, appropriate action is taken. Uh, sometimes this appropriate action is additional training, maybe it's replacement of an interviewer or whatever is necessary. But there's a good deal of evidence that this type of procedure, this whole set of procedures, are fairly effective although far from perfect in getting interviewers to do exactly what you want them to do, what they are expected to do. The, there's a good deal of uh, examination of the sources of errors and uh, experimental study, redesign of the questionnaires and other things that come out of these and other types of uh, research to uh, uh, to lead towards general improvement and design of the total system as well as control of the operation as it is being performed. Well, finally, the study is one of great national importance and of widespread use. It provides information to the Congress, the Council of Economic Advisors, to labor organizations, to business, and many others, and they show great interest and take various program actions on the basis of results. They establish advisory groups and review groups, and there's a great deal of interchange to help ensure that the program, the content of the program, is designed, and over time, its design improved to serve important national needs. Well, this is one illustration of a great many important national sample surveys. There are many much smaller types of surveys done for business, for marketing, for many other purposes. and. Uh, the technique has come to be powerful, wide, widely applied, applied, and exceedingly important method of getting information to guide planning, decisions, administration, research. Thank you. Sure. Are there any questions for Mr. Anderson? Uh, Morgan, I wanted to be willing to discuss.
comment on the consensus arrangement for handling the problem of confidentiality vis-a-vis -vis individuals and vis-a-vis -vis firms, business firms. Yes. Well, the Census Bureau uh, has legislation that um, requires that the information it collects from individuals, from firms, be treated confidentially. And a great deal of uh, effort is uh, made uh, to, to assure that this is complied with. Uh, people often assume that maybe uh, the government has certain information collected by the census. Why can't they use it for other purposes? And of course, this isn't so. Uh, the uh, great uh, extensive steps are taken to control the confidentiality at all of the stages of data collection. Interviewers are subject to fines and imprisonment if they reveal information. Census employees in the office are subject to fines and imprisonment if they reveal information. The facts are that they don't. And it has become a tremendously strong uh, tradition as well as requirement that, uh, that this type of control be strong and unequivocal. I'm not sure if I brought out the type of thing you have in mind, and maybe another question would bring it out. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe this is just what I wanted, but I have one other point. Uh, isn't this a unique arrangement that Census has? Now, you can correct me if I'm wrong. It is substantially unique in this kind of a respect. Uh, I'm not quite sure if it is totally, but almost any other, most agencies of the government that would collect statistical information for statistical purposes will pledge confident confidentiality and will indeed uh, provide confidentiality to the extent of their ability. However, the Census Bureau legislation is such that the census cannot be subjected to a court subpoena, for example, or a congressional subpoena. And the, the information is beyond reach by the ordinary judicial procedures. And uh, there have been times when uh, People up the line in the Department of Commerce where the census is located or in the White House have asked for information? The answer, of course, is no. It's not accessible. Uh, there's one, one final question. Uh, now, I, this is what I heard, and maybe you can correct me. Am I correct in information that I got that during the Second World War, when Japanese and American citizens were being moved from the California coast inland to the coast of Japan? As far as individual people are concerned, this is correct. Although the information was used, what might be regarded, and this is true of information in general, may be used to the disadvantage of a particular group because it was used to identify areas in which such uh, people were uh, where they lived. I don't know whether you call that to the disadvantage or not. Other methods might have been found, but the individual information was confidential. In other words, the Census Bureau could not be subpoenaed <coughs> somebody in there to provide the information on individuals. That's correct. I think there's some coffee and tea and cookies out in the hallway back there, and there will be a, a business meeting for the